as we join together in our doxology.
all year. Finally, it's, you know, I, I found out that we don't have fall. This is not fall. This is our second spring. The leaves, think about it, leaves will change colors, the flowers bloom. This is just a, a second spring, and, uh, and that's great. Although the leaves on my tree in the front yard are going to fall. They change color. Brown's a color, right? So they, they turn a beautiful brown, and then they drop on the ground. So, But I, I'm hey, glad to be here worshiping with you. Certainly glad that you are here this morning. I want you to if, call attention to our communication card here. I want you to keep that handy. I want you to, anytime that God is speaking to you, pull it out and share with us what God has told you. Maybe you have a prayer request, something you want to put down there. Or maybe you want to record your next spiritual step. Each one of us needs to take a spiritual step. Every one of us. And God is speaking to you now. Listen as He talks to you through the music, through the prayers, through everything that's going on here. And let us know what God is telling you. And you can put it in the offering envelope when it comes around a little bit later in the service. Pray with me. Father, we're grateful to be here today. Fill us, Lord, with your spirit. Fill us with energy and power that we may better serve you. For this we pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. I invite you once again to stand as we join together and as we sing together.
so that the body of Christ may be built up until we reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, pertaining to the whole measures of the fullness of Christ. Then we will no longer be infants tossed back and forth by the waves and blown here and there, by every word of teaching and by the cunning and craftiness of people in their deceitful schemes, Instead, speaking the truth in love, we will grow to become, in every respect, the mature body of him who is the head, that is Christ. I like to start my day doing a crossword puzzle and drinking coffee. You know, I figure I keep doing a crossword puzzle so I can know when I've lost my mind, you know. My memory fades. It's happening. And, you know, Saturdays are the worst. I'm done around Saturday than any other day because that's when the hard crossword puzzle is. On Monday, that's the easiest one. I'm a genius. I can't wait to tomorrow. I'm going to breeze through that thing. But it takes me longer on Saturday. So I get up and get a cup of coffee. I have a special pen I use for my crossword puzzles. It's light green. In case I make a mistake, I can fix it in black. That way I can say I do the crossword puzzle in ink. And so I need to get, up a, to get a cup of coffee and I put my pen down in a special place so I don't forget where it's at. <laughs> and then with my right. cup of coffee, I can't find my pen. I get up and lift up the couch. Where is my pen? <laughs> I don't have time for this. You know, I have time to get a cup of coffee. But this is important. I need to finish this crossword puzzle so I can get, get, get on with wasting the rest of my day. <clears throat> Finally, for some reason, I, I scratch my head. Well, oh, there it is. <laughs> Sometimes the things that we need are right there and we don't even know it. I know for a fact 
that everything we need to do God's work in this church is sitting in the pews right here, right now. Right now. Everything we need. God knows what we need. And He puts us together in a special way. One way He does this is, is what we call grace gifts. The charismata. We, uh, the Bible, the Greek word for that is grace gifts. That just means that He gives us these gifts that we don't earn them and we don't work for them, we don't study for them. They're just within our heart. And, you know, I, I can go over that whole list, in the, but I'm not going to. You know what they are. You've heard of them before. But we have all that. Everything that is needed for our church is provided by God in a supernatural way. It's also provided in a natural way as well. We all have natural and cultivated talents. We have gone to, uh, to school, uh, you know, and we have learned things. Some people have gone to more schooling than others, have gotten special skills, special licenses. Some people just pick this stuff up naturally. Sometimes we have cultivated talents. Some of you out there speak more than one language. Some more than two or three. <laughs> and often, like me, my language is picked up because I was born speaking Spanish. Well, I wasn't born speaking Spanish. That would be weird. <laughs> but I grew up speaking Spanish. Okay, not that Spanish is weird. It's just a grown up, you know, being born speaking is weird. And then I had to learn English. And I learned English the hard way. I didn't go to English as a second language, school or anything like that. They threw me in a class of English speaking people. And I don't know, one day I was speaking English. By one day, I mean by the time I was in the second grade, it took that long. But that's a talent, being bilingual. I know it's no big deal here in San Antonio, right? Who doesn't speak Spanish? You can't even say San Antonio without speaking Spanish. True. But I went on a mission trip, uh, a medical mission trip, and I don't know how to take blood pressure. I don't even know how to take temperatures. But I know how to speak Spanish, and the doctors, they knew all that stuff. And so I would tell the patient, or you know, I would do the translating. So that was part of a medical mission trip. That was very important. A thing that I was doing, just speaking the language. Some people have secretarial skills. Some people have nice handwriting. That is a gift. Craftsmanship, cooking, you know, and not only do you have these skills, but some people enjoy it. Most of us can cook. I mean, how hard is it, right? You get a box and you dump the noodles in the bowl of water and you open the little package and throw it in there. Oh, I forgot. Uh, there's milk and, and maybe, I don't know. Well, maybe not all of us can cook. But some people really enjoy cooking. It just, it amazes me. You know, uh, that, that's why I, I don't do the cooking in the house. We'd be eating macaroni and cheese every night. And I'd be the only one who would like it and wonder, well, you know, if, if you don't like the way I cook it, put some Tabasco sauce in there, right? <laughs> but we all have talents. We all have things we enjoy. Everybody has something. And some of the skills that are needed in the church are just very simple that anybody can do it, and they're still very important. Too often, we overlook the fact that the folks sitting in our pews have important jobs. And we don't let, you know, we, we, we have this idea that we need professionals to do stuff. You know, one time I heard about this pastor who, he had a very high level person in his church, somebody that had a lot of skills, a lot of gifts, and it was also very busy. And the pastor needed someone to head up this important committee. And he was going to tag this guy. And he said, you know what? This isn't a good time for him. I know that, that he's busy. And within a couple of weeks, the guy comes up to him and tells the pastor that he took an important job volunteering for some committee in a citywide effort that was going to be much more difficult than what the pastor had needed him to do in the church. Busy people tend to be the ones <clears throat> that can do more things. 
That's why they're busy. So don't overlook people. Don't, don't think that someone is busy. That's the problem I have. Sometimes I worry about people in a church that have too many jobs, do too much stuff, as if they don't know how to take care of themselves, and it's somehow my job to take care of them. I was taught early on, I don't follow this rule very uh, as well as I should, that people can take care of themselves. They can take, take care of their own wallets. Don't be worried about asking them to give to some special offering. If they don't want to give, they won't give. That's not my job to, to do that. And if they don't want to serve, they won't serve. It's not my job to control what they're going to do. People control themselves. That's a great thing. We all need to learn that. We also need to learn that whatever you do on the outside of the walls of the church, you can do for God. Unless it's like selling drugs. The selling part is good, the drugs part not. Unless, well, if you're a pharmacist, that's okay, I suppose. You know, everybody has something, and even our life's experiences, whether good or bad, can be used by God for His purposes, for His glory. Now, it tells us in our scripture today, He gave some as apostles, some as prophets, some as evangelists, some as pastors and teachers for the equipping of the saints for the work of service to the building up of Christ. The job of the pastor, it tells us here, is to equip the church to do good works, not to do the good works themselves. You know, there was a, a wonderful movie I saw. It was about a pastor in some major, you know, one of these mainline denominational churches, and they were going to close that church down. Apparently, somebody wanted to uh, buy the land, and the denomination was okay with that because the church was very tiny, nothing was going on there, Bunch of old people, dying church, it's time to move on. But they sent a young pastor in there. This guy, you know, he, he wasn't very experienced. This is the kind of thing they wanted to send them to. This is one of those denominations where the pastor gets moved from church to church. And so this church was seen as an opportunity for him to practice preaching, you know, funerals apparently in that church. So practice some of these things. But he didn't want the church to close down. There were some people who wanted the church to close down. And there was a group of immigrants, I don't know from what country, they were Asian, that had been relocated to that community. They were refugees. And so he had this great idea. The church had all this land, so he started farming the land to give, to raise food for these people. They grow their own food. They knew how to do that. So, you know, he, he borrowed some farm equipment, they plowed the land, they got it ready, they planted it, and they were off to do this thing. However, the people were not helping. He had to water, he had to do everything. And he resented it. He resented the fact that he was doing this for this community. They agreed to be a part of it, and then nobody's coming out and watering, and he was having a terrible time. He had to have a machine that, that's watered because they didn't have a well. And then the truck broke down and, oh man, all kinds of things happened. He was very angry. And I, can, I believe it, you know. Wouldn't you be? You are doing stuff for these people? Now, the, the point of the movie wasn't this, but then I realized, wow, here's a pastor doing all the work and then resenting the people aren't helping him. Too often, that's what the church is doing. They hire somebody to do the job. He does it by himself. He resents that he's doing it. And how do I know whether I'm doing God's will or not? Often, I figure I'm not doing God's will if I'm angry and if I'm doing it myself. I can never forget, number one, my job is to equip the people. That's my job. Number two, the Bible tells us we're to go and make disciples. So I'm equipping people to make disciples. And if that's not happening, I'm not doing my job. And if I'm angry, maybe that's the Holy Spirit speaking to me. That I'm doing the wrong job. And so the job of the pastor and evangelist are to equip the people to do good works. Now, it's very easy 
for a pastor because of the training that we have to just come in, do the preaching, all the preaching, do this, do that, do the things, and just, you know, enjoy the nice uh, front, you know, get in front of the line at the potluck and sit down. And, but that's not the job. That's not going and making disciples. The job is to equip the saints for the work of service, to build the body of Christ. And so we need to think of the paid staff of the church as a cadre. I learned that word specifically in the, in the Navy. See, the Navy has security forces that guard the gates. They used to be done by Marines, but then it became done by sailors. You know, they give out the traffic tickets and the parking tickets, and they watch the gate and all this stuff. And these are regular, everyday sailors. Specifically, sailors who spend most of their time at sea. There's not enough jobs ashore for somebody who's a hull tech or something like that to be doing. So we had to say, okay, how about we make them security forces? And what they have there is an actual security force called the cadre. There's a handful of sailors who are master at arms. They're the shore patrol, the real police of the Navy. And they're the ones that train everybody. They don't go, their job isn't to go out and hand out tickets. They teach you how to give a ticket. I'm not going to teach you how to give tickets. So let's not take this one too far. But my job is to prepare you, to equip you, to do the ministry, to do the work of the church. God's intent for His church was for all of us to work together in the spreading of the gospel. Not to have a few hired guns to do the job. Where we get a little confused here is when we develop an attractional church that works on entertainment. And so we get the right band together, we get the right preacher who attracts people, and so they do all the work. People come in, sit down, they get their weekly Jesus on, and then they walk out the door, they go to Snowbiz. I know Snowbiz is closed, but I just like the name. <laughs> and then they go on to their lives. And on Monday morning, they, it's whatever they do is what they're doing, and they don't think about Jesus anymore. It's very easy to do the way we have set up the American church. And that does not look anything like the church in Acts chapter 2. Not a bit, not even close. I don't know how we got to that point. But the church is a body of believers working together, living life together, and bringing others in. And when we look at Acts chapter 2, the part that I find amazing is that the Lord added daily to their number. And when we look at Acts chapter 6, where there was a bit of a problem there with the widows, some widows getting more food than other widows, and they figured that problem out within the church, they wanted the apostles to fix it. Get the pastor over here. He'll know what to do. When the apostles came and says, you guys figure it out. Pick some people from among you and figure it out. They did that. And again, the Bible tells us the Lord added to their number. The ones that were being saved, by the way. He didn't just add their, the number. The ones who were sitting in the pew enjoying it. The church is not a spectator sport. You know, we got to watch uh, the University of Texas play Oklahoma for the Red River Championship. Oklahoma University and, and Texas always play every year the battle over the Red River. And what happened is Texas lost, so the border has now moved to the north of the Red River or, or to the south of the Red River. They own it now. I don't know if that's what happens, but what I do know is that these people on the field, these football players, they were tired. They were playing their hearts out. Because the game was close. And the closer the game is, the harder you play. And Tracy was noticing that the UT players were getting a little tired. She wanted to get out there and give themselves to be tired about. <coughs> they were desperately in need of rest. And the stands were filled with people who were desperately in need of exercise. 
This is a church today. The pew is filled with people who are desperately in need of spiritual exercise. Now, don't get me wrong. I don't think all these people should restore in the field. But that's what we need to do. We need to exercise our spiritual faith. Christianity is not a spectator sport. Service builds you up spiritually. And it builds the church as well. You know, the strange thing is when people feel they belong to a church, they stay. This is my church. They stay. It builds the process of belonging. To serve is part of that process. To serve is to belong. It gives you purpose. It builds friendships. And it builds the kingdom of God. Teamwork leads to growth. You know, teamwork is another word for unity. Corporations try to do this artificially. They'll go on some kind of adventure kind of thing. It's very popular so that in the process of, of trying to work together and get across this river or something, it builds teamwork and unity and they transfer that back when they go. Sometimes they do it through service. It became very popular in the years following Hurricane Katrina for corporations to go out and go on disaster relief. They're doing something significant together. And it works out a whole lot better when they get back to their corporation, when they put on their suit. Well, I guess nobody wears suits and ties anymore. I don't think it works. But when they get back to work, they're ready to work together. Teamwork builds growth. It builds growth in the church as well. You know, we're living in a disaster. There are people out there who are hungry. There are people out there who are in need. There are people out there who are lonely. Need prayer. Need food. Need clothes. Mostly. Need a friend. And the church can do that. I can't do that. I can only do one person things. But the church, each one of you can do one person things. And look how that multiplies. <coughs> Through service, we build unity and we build maturity. You know, <clears throat> there are tests that you can take to discover what your spiritual gift is. I think I've taken them all. Not because I can't figure it out, but because I'm trying to see how good the test is. And that's okay. I mean, it really is. It doesn't hurt anything. But it also, also doesn't prove anything. I think the best way to figure out what you can do is understand what you can do already and do it in the church or try out different things. I found out right away that I'm not really good at teaching four-year-olds uh, training union on Sunday night. It just wasn't my thing. And I figured out because the guy I was working with, it was definitely his thing. He's on the floor crawling, kids crawling on him. Everybody's laughing and giggling, and I'm standing in a little sitting in a corner. <laughs> yeah, those of you who know me can picture that, can't you? <laughs> Eventually, I kind of figured out what I could do and what I couldn't do and what I really enjoyed. Oh, On-the-job training is, is the best way. You can't fail in a church by trying. You know... It tells us in verse 14, then we will no longer be infants tossed back and forth by the waves, blown here and there by every wind of teaching and by the cunning and craftiness of people in deceitful schemes. One sign of immaturity is that you are easily swayed from what's true. You hear a conspiracy theory and you fall for it. You listen to some weird preacher on the radio and you think that's the truth because you don't know the truth. Jesus said, you'll know the truth and it will set you free. You fall for 
for wrong doctrines and schemes because you don't know the truth for yourself. I was shocked to learn that most converts to Mormonism and Jehovah's Witnesses are Baptists. How is that possible? They don't know what they think they know, what they're supposed to know. They're not reading their Bibles. And so somebody comes and tells them a few things and they fall for it. Mormons are the best because they will connect with the things that Baptists believe that you may have heard and eventually work their way to teaching you the doctrines that are not true. You know, and these sometimes people like that who are religious, you know, they, they are, or they're spiritual, they believe in God, or they believe there is a God, and they wind up joining the Branch Davidians, or following Jim Jones to South America. You can, they get tossed by every wind of doctrine. Mature Christians have an unshakable faith. They know the truth. And when they hear something that they've never heard before, they go to the Bible. Or they go to their Christian friends. i got to confess to you that the Mormons came to my house. I was working nights, so I was there at home like a sitting duck. And they began to show me pictures and tell me stories and likable people. I asked, I started asking my Christian friends, hey, you know, what about this? And one guy said, let me be there the next time they come. I'd like to be there. He was a preacher's kid. So he sat down there with me and he asked him some questions that I immediately understood the answers to were wrong because I knew enough of the Bible. Mature Christians have an unshakable faith and if you're a maturing Christian, you at least ought to have Christians around you that can help you wrestle with these things. And don't just have one opinion. Ask a few of your Christian friends. In, in the council of many, the truth comes out. That's sort of uh, what it says in Proverbs. The gist is correct. I didn't get the words in the right order. To become a mature Christian, you need to read the Bible, you need to study it, and you especially need to study it with a group of other Christians. We have Sunday school here every Sunday at 9.30. That's a good place for you to grow. It's a good place for you to help others grow. Instead, it tells us in verse 15, speaking the truth in love, we will grow to become in every respect the mature body of him who is the head, that is Christ. Maturity means that we become more like Christ. You know, we can grow in knowledge reading the Bible by ourselves. But we really need to study it with a group of other Christians to grow in maturity. And that maturity is when we begin to act more like Jesus Christ. Knowing the truth. We should share it with others. Maturing Christians teach and encourage others to become disciples. The Bible tells us, go and make disciples. That's what Jesus said. He didn't say, go and become smarter Christians. Maturing Christians are role models in their words and deeds. They will take new believers under their wing and invite them and on ministry projects, service, they'll bring them along and bring them closer to the body of Christ. So I've heard the body of Christ described as, you know, you begin with a core of people that are very mature, and they're the heart of the church, and then different levels of commitment in circles, concentric circles moving out. Until you have people that are in the fringes, people on the outside, people who are not really committed. And the goal of the mature Christians is to help others come slowly 
towards the center with patience and with love. Sometimes we think that a Christian is just someone in the United States who follows certain culture. But that's not what the Bible tells us. Sometimes we think Christianity is something about magic and rituals showing up on Easter and on Sunday and on uh, Christmas. That's not what the Bible tells us. The Bible tells us that we're to grow in maturity and become more like Jesus. Ask this question to yourself. Are you more like Jesus? Or are you becoming less like Jesus? You know, i got to tell you, I may be prejudiced about this, but I believe that most of the world's problems could be solved if we were more like Jesus. Just a little bit more like Jesus. Some of the things I see in the news, every day, I look at this as if we're, we're, we're farther from Jesus than we, well, than we think we are. Too many people who call themselves Christians are on the outer edges of the faith. And that's a good thing, because that means that you can grow so much more than the others. A person that's on the outer edges of Christianity can take a step towards Jesus. And the difference would be tremendous. <clears throat> Some of you have been members and, not, and are not serving. You have not found a place in the kingdom. I encourage you this morning. If that describes you, take that step. Take another step. Commit yourself more to faith. Figure out what it is that you can do and how you can serve the church with it. There is nothing that God has given you that He can't use to build His kingdom. And some of you are right in that heart, very mature Christians, right there. I thank God for you. But you need to think right now, how close are you? Because a mature Christian is helping others to mature. You don't retire from Christianity. We call that, well, going to heaven. We call that your reward. You know, we, we love retirement. Some of us who are retired are probably really reveling in it, right? You get to sleep in on Monday morning and that check still comes in. May not be as big a check. As, uh, as you used to get, but wow, you're, you're sleeping in. Well, you know, that doesn't, and for faith, for Christians, in the body of Christ, our reward is actually going to heaven. So it's, if you're still breathing, and most of you here are still breathing, <laughs> you in the back, oh, he was just sleeping. <laughs> We're still serving. We still have something to do. We still have. There was a, I remember Crockett Thigpen. He's been gone for a long time. But Crockett Thigpen would get the, the birthday list every month. And on your birthday, he would call you and wish you a happy birthday. You know, and, and he, he was not able to leave his house anymore, by the way. But wow! Wow! What if Crockett Thigpen's call was the only call you got on your birthday? That would be worth it. That was kingdom building. And anybody can do that. Well, anybody who's got a phone. If you don't have a phone, just open up your window and yell out the window. <laughs> but seriously, folks. If you are a mature Christian, you need to be finding someone to help become more mature. You know, we have a program at the church called Multiply. And that program is, not, is, based, is a program that helps you learn more about the Bible. It covers the entire Bible <coughs> through the lens of the, of the conservative Christian faith that we have. And it's not just for mature Christians 
to help immature Christians. Iron sharpens iron, so two mature Christians can build each other up. Two immature Christians can build each other up. But it is a, the easiest, simplest way to connect. And you can do it over the phone. You youngsters, you can do it over Zoom or FaceTime or whatever you do. But folks, we all need to be not only becoming more mature ourselves, but taking someone along with us. It's not hard. Not hard at all. And it's what God wants us to do. Go and make disciples. We're going to listen to another song. And as we do that, pull out your communication card. And let me know what next step you're going to take. How you're going to handle this word that we have gotten. What are you going to do? Are you ready to take another step? <clears throat> Pull out your cards and, we'll, and do this as we listen to the song. <clears throat> upon us. We still have uh, some envelopes left if, if you want to walk. Oh, there she is. Linda, do we, do we, yeah, we do. Okay. Yes. We do have envelopes left. And, or if you'd like to contribute to some, for someone, uh, a lot of people have their envelopes on them. If you have your envelope today, lift it up. Okay, so there, there we go. Okay. <laughs> We have a few people, oh, there we go. Somebody showing two envelopes. <laughs> Ambitious. <laughs> She's holding it up for somebody else. But, you know, you can contribute to somebody else walking. So, uh, you know, this is uh, kind of fun, I think. The hunger walk, it's a time of fellowship for the church. I love seeing the people that show up, you know, and, uh, for, the hung, for the walk. It's uh, people of all ages show up. Well, not all ages, but young and old. We, you know what, maybe all ages. We actually have had people in strollers uh, that have been pushed around. So some from infancy have been doing a hunger walk. But uh, I encourage you to, to do this. It's a good thing, a great cause, and another way to fellowship together. We, uh, the hunger walk is at the uh, Comanche Park. I don't know, number one, two, number two, Comanche Park number two. 
I don't even know where Comanche Park number one is. But so, so I'll never get lost unless they tell me to go to Comanche Park number five or something. Pray with me. Lord, we thank you once again for providing for us and especially for the opportunity to help to provide for others. As we gather these tithes and offerings, Lord, we pray that you receive them, that you multiply them, and that you help us to use them to your glory. For this we pray in the name of Jesus. Amen.
going to sing one more verse. Come if God is calling you. give you peace at all times and in every way. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all.